Hey everyone and welcome to another video guys and today I'm incredibly excited to share with you my Lucian mid lane guide. Now I've done a lot of research for this video, I've spoken to both AD carry Lucian players, mid lane Lucian players, high low players, pro players, watched a lot of VODs, played it a lot myself and what I've realized is that there is a lot of little details both micro wise and knowledge wise that you really need to understand if you want to be consistent with mid lane Lucian. So without further ado, let's dive straight in. Make sure that you either have maybe a Google Doc or a notepad available because there is a lot of information and it can get a little bit overwhelming. Now the way I want to kick off this video guys is share with you what I believe to be possible when playing mid lane Lucian. Now I had the opportunity to talk to a high elo Lucian player on our server who's very very good at this champion and ask him how does he average CS numbers like this? He's literally averaging between 10 to 12 CS per minute with this champion consistently and has a lot of success with the champion. And I asked him all of these questions, what are you doing differently? And basically he told me all these little things about the micro element of the, the knowledge element of this champion. And what I realized is that you need to understand all the differences between the itemization, how the starting item affects your early lane, how the first item affects how you play trades and how you can play the early lane and even just macro-wise, how it changes everything. And he shared with me a lot of this information. And today, we're actually going to go over specifically one of his VODs, break down what he does specifically. Um, and hopefully, by the end of this entire guide, you're going to have a very solid understanding of what you need to do specifically in order to be very consistent, have great CS numbers, and have a lot of success with this champion, guys. So, the first thing you may ask is, why Lucian mid lane? Why was it played in the first place? Why did it randomly crop up? And what actually makes it strong? Now... Lucian mid actually received three meaningful buffs in season 10. The first one was in patch 10.11 where the non-minion second uh, second shot critical strike bonus damage increased from um, 75 plus 18.75 to 100 plus 25%, which is also why the crit build is so strong at the moment. And in Korea, we also we largely see the Essence Reaver IE build the most. In patch 10.13, the second buff, Piercing Light increased effect radius from 900 to 1,000 units. This was probably the most meaningful buff in my opinion because this is what allows you to navigate those long-range uh, mage matchups. And we'll get to this a little bit later. And the third one was Piercing Light increased base damage and Culling increased shots fired. So between all of these buffs, people realize that solo lane Lucian, both top and mid, is extremely viable. Now, Lucian mid lane also has very few unfavorable matchups, and due to the Q range buffs, can now navigate matchups he used to struggle within. So previously, you know, in the past, champions like Syndra and Orianna would actually do quite well into Lucian because Lucian only had one style. He could only trade aggressively with E and go forward, but now he can actually take non-committal trades because of this Q range buff and poke from a distance. And this is actually very meaningful for Lucian mid lane. The next one, Lucian build, Lucian's build flexibility allows him to navigate all the differing matchups. This is incredibly important to understand. And if there is one thing you're going to take away from this entire video, it should be the itemization section. You need to understand how itemization actually covers for all of Lucian's weaknesses within his kit and within his champion's identity. And we're going to go into that very extensively. And on top of this, Lucian is incredibly difficult to gank if piloted correctly. If you're not just randomly spamming your E going forward and that sort of thing, you can basically never get ganked. And the main reason being actually is because you get so much priority, especially in the early game, and you take such favorable trades, you should always have vision control or control over the river or at least a ward on the ramp. So as long as you have the mid lane fundamentals down, understand basic jungle tracking, warding, that sort of thing, it's very, very difficult to get ganked in combination with that vision and um, having a very low cooldown dash. And lastly, guys, Lucian generates a lot of priority, a lot of pressure, which is extremely valuable within solo queue because it generates a lot of options for your teammates, release pressure in side lanes, and allows your jungle to be very proactive. Now for Lucian's identity, guys, and how exactly does Lucian mid lane work at a very fundamental level? And the first thing you need to get your head around is that Lucian uses his early game power and early lane strength to build greedily in scale. Very similar to Azir and Syndra, how Azir and Syndra get a lot of early priority, but they don't necessarily overextend themselves. They don't want to trade one for one. They don't want to blow flash. They want to use their early strength to farm up a storm and spike in the mid game. Very similar to Lucian. This is actually why you see so much coal Lucian. You see a lot of man immune Lucian, a BF, BF sword first item Lucian, incredibly greedy builds, and he can get away with it because his early game strength is so 
incredibly strong and he's very difficult to punish in the early lane. So that's the way you got to view Lucian. Very calculated, farm oriented. Yes, you can play aggressive, but you don't want to trade one for one. You don't want to just unnecessarily blow flash. You don't want to give up CS for crazy roams. You want to make sure you're CSing very well. You want to make sure you're playing off your key item spikes and utilize your early lane strength to build greedily. So then when it does come to mid game, you're incredibly inf inflated in terms of just XP and gold and you spike much earlier than everyone else in the game. Now, another interesting thing about Lucian is that he's so flexible in the way he can approach team fights. He can play the slow, sustained front-to-back team fight, or he can also play the heavy burst-oriented dive style, diving onto the enemy AD carry. It just really depends on the build he goes for or what other champions are on his team. And the third point here, guys, is that Lucian should be using his superior build path to farm camps efficiently, both in the early game within the laning phase and in the side lane when you're in the mid to late game. And this is actually how you transition early leads, especially when you're going that Sanguine Blade build path, which we'll talk about in a second. And lastly here, guys, you wanna be using your early strength to win games by doing one of three things here, or even a combination of all of them. The first one, solo killing your opponent, and we'll talk about how to do that. Number two, getting plates and denying the enemy CS. We'll talk about how to do that as well. And number three, getting Rift Heralds and destroying that mid tier one tower, which you should be able to do relatively reliably um, because of that early lane strength. And ideally, you know, a combination of all of the above. And lastly here, guys, I want you to keep in mind that Lucian really does require good fundamentals. If you don't have leaning down pat or warding, basic wave management, you know, tempo assessment, basic jungle tracking, you will struggle when playing this champion. But one thing I would like to hear from you guys in the community is how effective you guys think Lucian mid lane is in low elo. Because a, a part of me actually thinks Lucian mid lane could be very good in low elo because Lucian is largely countered by junglers, not anyone in the 1v1. And in low elo, junglers aren't very, very good at ganking. They don't really understand how to gank effectively. So if you have basic warding down pad, I actually think Lucian could be a very good low elo champion as well. But I'd love to hear back from you guys in the community. Now for the itemization section, guys. So there's four main build paths that you need to understand with Lucian mid lane if you want to be reliable with this champion. Each build path has unique strengths and weaknesses and cover or highlight certain parts of Lucian's kit. And the first one we're going to cover today is the Sanguine Blade build path. And this is the best PVE build path that actually allows you to go 12 CS per minute. You can't go 12 CS per minute with any other build path apart from this one because Sanguine Blade gives you attack speed, gives you life steal, and a decent amount of AD, which allows you to farm camps better than any other build path. So before we get into the core items, let's actually talk about the starting items, right? So the three starting items you can go if you want to go this specific um, route is either Corrupting Pot, Long Sword, and Three Pods, and Cull. Now, Corrupting Pot is the most common starting item in Korea, and it's probably the most flexible. And the reason being is that Lucian both wants access to resources in terms of HP and mana. He is quite mana reliant in the early portion of the game because you do want to poke with Q, you do want to E forward, you want to get that W off to get the extra movement speed, chase people down, that sort of thing. Um, Corrupting Pot, if you're really not sure what item to start with, Corrupting Pot is your best bet. It's just overall a very solid um, item choice. And the only downside of this item choice, if you are going to go this specific build path, is that it doesn't contribute anything towards your um, Serrated Dirk or your Vam Scepter. Which leads me to the second item choice, which is Longsword. Longsword 3 Pots. And the great thing about Longsword 3 Pots is you get a lot of access to HP over an extended period of time with those three pots. So you, you can actually trade very aggressively, like levels one, two, take a heavy trade, but heal back up over a long period of time. And the great thing about this one is that it allows you to get your Dirk much earlier. And Dirk's actually very important for your level six bike because you can actually just one-shot people uh, with your culling and, and Dirk, especially when you proc that PTA first. Or if you're versing a poke oriented champion, you're versing like a Zarath or something like that, it allows you to get your Vamp Scepter very early in the game and life still count as poke. So this gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of, you know, where you want to go in terms of that first item choice when building Sanguine Blade. And the third item is Cull. Now you only want to be going Cull in very scale oriented, easy, easy matchups. Um, I don't go cull too often anymore because I feel like I can just play more aggressive with these two items because of the access to resources. Yes, um, the cull early life on hit does give you a, a you know a decent amount of sustain, 
but it's nothing, you know, nothing in comparison to the corrupting pot and the longsword three pots. And if you really want to play aggressive in the early portion of lane, you need either corrupting or longsword. And we'll get to cull a little bit later. I just don't think it's the best with this specific Sanguine Blade strategy. Now, when you're building Sanguine Blade, Serrated Dirk is just great. And especially, um, like I said before, as you hit level six. So a lot of the time you get level six, you get your Dirk, you can W, auto attack, auto attack, E, auto attack, whatever, proc the PTA, run them down with your ultimate, and you nearly can one shot or one combo any mid laner, even if they're sitting on a cloth armor. Same thing goes for junglers. Um, when I'm talking, when I was talking to that high elo Lucian player, he was telling me how he gets a lot of kills by getting Dirk level six, shoving the wave, walking into the enemy jungle, and just mowing down the enemy jungle with this um, early lethality. Because no junglers actually expect Lucian mid lanes to be going lethality. They expect it from something like a Zed or you know, or like a Kiana or something like that. But they don't expect it from a Lucian mid lane. So it's often or common that they don't even have a single cloth armor. Um, but if you need that, you know, you know, reduction from poke, then life steal is very good. Now, once you get uh, one of the biggest strengths of this item, by the way, guys, is that if you chunk out the enemy or maybe you slow build and you poke them out and they can't really stay under tower, this is the best item for killing plates. You absolutely obliterate plates. And that actually ties in to, you know, Lucian's identity perfectly because you are a very much a big lane bully. You can poke out your opponent very easily with your culling or just, you know, by all inning them down the long lane, that sort of thing. And if they back up, you can easily get one, two plates by yourself. It, it like, it actively changes how many plates you're going to get in the lane. And because you're isolated so much and one of the best 1v1 champions, you get a lot of value from this item. And the theory is, guys, what you can get done with Sanguine in the early to mid game makes up for its poor team fighting strength. Yes, it doesn't scale as well. Yes, if it gets to late, you know, mid to late game team fighting, it's probably it's nowhere near as gonna perform as well as like a Man Immune build or the Essence IE build or even like the Bork build. But you can just get so many things done. And especially if you're playing with a fast paced, early aggressive jungler, something like an Elise or even like to be honest, even like any AP jungle, you're going to get river control. You're going to get that early rift held. This is going to allow you to get more plates, allow you to break that mid tier one and really snowball the game. If you die or get behind with this build, sorry, you are kind of screwed. And that actually happened to me last night on stream where I got behind with this build and I was useless because I can't team fight. Um, but it is very, very good in the side lane and a very good snowballing item. And the way you want to view it, if, if any of you guys have actually played Dota 2 out there, the guy who I was actually talking to, he compared it with Battle Fury and Dota 2. It's not obviously not the same, but the premise is kind of similar, where it actually allows you to farm faster. It's the best PvE item in the entire game. Compare it with Essence Reaver. If you're going Essence Reaver first item, you don't have the attack speed or the lifesteal to farm camps. If you go Bork, you don't really have enough AD. Um, you don't really have enough AD, and this gives you way more attack speed. If you go Man Immune, you definitely can't do camps because you have no life steal, no attack speed, um, that sort of thing. The only downside with this is it doesn't really give you CDR, but again, it just makes there's so many strengths of it, it really kind of makes up for what you lose. Um, and the other point he said about Sanguine, what he really likes about it, is because solo queue is often about making picks and people getting caught out of position, Sanguine Blade really makes a lot of sense, especially when you're in the mid game, catching people, you know, rotating from a side lane to a team fight. You can actually burst people very well with this item, and we'll show that later on in the VOD in this guide. Now, second item, you want to be rounding it out with Essence Reaver, and I get a lot of questions about build order. One thing, that you, one thing that you do need to understand with this build when you're building Essence Reaver, you really want to be aiming for BF Sword first every single time. And a big mistake people actually do, let's just say they have like 1500 gold, they actually go Caulfield's Warhammer. It's better to go BF Sword, Cloak of Agility with Double Long Sword, um, just because of how great crit is with, uh, with Lucian um, in general. And one thing you need to think about with this build as well, um, it's a lot of AD, so your wave clear, and because you're farming so well, your wave clear is going to be very effective in the early portion of the game. Then you want to round it off with IE, same premise, you want to be going BF Sword into Cloak of Agility, not Pickaxe, that's the order. So there are your three core items. Now, in terms of rounding out your build for fourth and fifth item, it really depends um, on the game state, or what you're versing, and what's going on. So, generally, you want to be going a zeal item, fourth item, or if you need the protection from AP burst, you want to be going hex drinker or more. But let's just say you're not versing a lot of heavy AP, and you want a zeal item. If you're versing burst-oriented assassins, you want to be going PD. If you need range, 
um, you want to be going rapid fire cannon. So if you're versing high range mages, that sort of thing, rapid fire is very effective. Now, let's just say you've just got one of these items. Then this is, again, where things get a little bit, just really depends on what's going on in the game. Let's actually talk about Black Cleaver first. I am still under the assumption that Black Cleaver is best or highest value when there's other people on your team that can, can actually utilize the Black Cleaver passive. So if you have another AD carry on your team, for example, or like a Kindred or a Graze where they can actually get value from the reduced armor, um, that sort of thing, then Black Cleaver is very effective. But let's just say you're the only auto attack based damage champion, um, or maybe you're 80 carries behind, or maybe you have some like mage bot lane. Black Cleaver is really not that effective, and you'd get more value from going a last one of these last whisper items. Um, double zeal item is also completely fine, but still, you're not going to get, you know, you're only going to get max 75% crit, which is a little bit problematic. I have seen a lot of. Death Dance as a fourth, fourth, fifth item, which is also very good. Gives you extra life steal, um, gives you a lot of durability. Again, it's very expensive, so unless you're very accelerate, accelerated, which you should be, um, I wouldn't recommend it. If you are versing a lot of AD burst, again, GA is solid. BT is actually very solid on Lucian because of how effective just raw AD is on Lucian because of the AD scaling with the culling and piercing light. Piercing light has like a, what, 60 to what, 60 to 120 ratio or bonus AD ratio. Culling has an incredible ratio as well. Um, so BT is something you should look into. Larger, this is all preference, but mainly you want to be going zeal item and then experiment with what you really need here. Pretty self-explanatory. And if you want more understanding of itemization, watch my itemization video separately. And QSS is also a very important item. And Lucian does get value from Mercurial, Mercurial Scimitar as well. So don't feel bad for building QSS. Uh, so this is the first build path, plate destroyer, early aggression, that sort of thing. Now, before we move on to the next build path, I want to quickly talk about boots. All right. So there are a lot of players on a Bjergsen is a big fan of CDR boots. What I've realized as well, talking to this, this Lucian player, he's a massive fan of Berserker Grease because of it's actually like the cheapest form of early attack speed. The cheap boots, very easy to buy. Lucian gets a lot of value from attack speed. Um, obviously getting, you know, having a lot of AD damage. That sort of thing. But majority of the time, you either you should be going Berserker Greaves if you don't need the access to um, Tenacity, or if you don't need the access to Armor, then Berserker Greaves is your best bet. It feels like CDR is a bit of a bait. You just get way more early damage with Berserker Greaves, which just really suits Lucian's identity, because you want to be pushing the pace of the game and abusing your early power. Um, most of the time for me, I actually find myself building one of these defensive uh, boots, but if you can get away with it, Berserker is, is your best bet. Now, for early bases, let's just say for some reason you can't afford a Dirk or you can't afford a Vam Scepter, maybe you get shoved out of lane early, sitting on an early uh, Doran's Blade is very effective. So don't feel bad for going um, early Doran's Blade. And something to keep in mind, guys, if you are versing Assassins, going do or do like double Doran's Blade is very effective because of the durability, giving you a lot of HP. So don't feel bad for going back for an early, um, early Doran's Blade. Now for the second build path, this is the Man Immune build, where a lot of people uh, want to know more about this build, why it works, why it's wrong, why certain people play it, that sort of thing. So let's go into the nitty gritty here. First thing I want to quickly touch on, the same premise with the early game items. Now I've actually included Doran's Blade. Now, Doran's Blade, I, I'm actually just not a fan of Doran's Blade as an item. And I talked about this within my itemization video. And the main weakness of Doran's Blade is that in order to get access to the healing, you need to auto attack the wave a lot. And because Lucian actually wants to slow build waves, he doesn't want to just hard push waves all the time. He doesn't want to just auto the wave all the time. Um, you don't get as much access to your or to regeneration, to health regen, that sort of thing, because it's through lifesteal. So I'm not a massive fan of it. I just personally like Corrupting Pot or Longsword because I don't need to attack the wave to get my resources back. That is the, the main weakness of Doran's Blade. But if you like the extra durability, if you're versing sometimes like an assassin, having that extra HP does come in handy. It is a preference thing. You should experiment with it. Now, first thing I want to point out, guys, with Man Immune is that it does not give CDR, and CDR is relatively important with Lucian because of how, um, you know, how strong his ultimate is, but let's just quickly talk about Man Immune as an item. Now, this build is the best scaling build. It's the best six item build. The reason being is that it gives you the most amount of AD, 
um, because of how, you know, the Muramana, obviously synergizing as well with presence of mind, that sort of thing. So your ultimate, your culling does it a ridiculous amount of damage. And as you can see here, culling scales with uh, total AD and piercing light as well scales incredibly well with bonus AD from going from 60 to 120 at level 5. So just AD in general on Lucian is very effective just for um, scaling. The main weakness of this build is that there's a 10 minute lull state. It takes you, if you stack it very effectively, by the time you get tier, it takes 10 minutes to upgrade to Muramana. Now, in my opinion, that's too slow. I, I've actually gone off this build completely because it just feels way too slow for solo queue. In competitive, it's a different story because the games are much slower, much more calculated, and having the access to that, you know, that, that really solid culling damage, that sort of thing in team fights, man immune is very effective. But if you're in solo queue playing this champion, it's actually not the build path I would recommend. It's like, I'll actually go over the next build, which I do recommend, the Essence Reaver build, um, for most players. So keep in mind, this is a very slow scaling build. It works in competitive, not so much in solo queue. But if you are that very passive scaling style laner, this might be the build for you. Now, if you do want to go this build, guys, um, never build tier first, ever. It's... Absolutely awful. If you build tier first on Lucian, you're just defeating the point of playing this champion. You always want to be going pickaxe first, and ideally, you want to avoid basing on a on a mana, a mana crystal at all. You never want to base on just... You want to make sure you have enough gold for either pickaxe or pickaxe and tier. You don't want to base when you're just getting a mana crystal. Try and avoid that at all costs. Um, and after you get your mana immune here, guys, you want to be going for Essence Reaver second. Same premise, BF Sword into... Um, Cloak of Agility plus Double Longsword if possible, that sort of thing. Get your Essence Reaver, and it will take you a very long time to spike. Your Wave Clear is way less. You have no life still. The other thing with this build that I'm not a fan, it doesn't have any attack speed again, and your Wave Clear is significantly lower. But this, is, this item is very cheap. you got to keep that in mind. Um, Essence Reaver, second core item, IE, third core item, that sort of thing. Same premise with the next items. You can either go double zeal item if need be. Same premise, you need burst protection, um, PD, range, you want to go uh, rapid fire, or you need more, that sort of thing. Exact same premise here. Now, I've got a few notes in this bottom left-hand corner. Again, if you're versing like a very burst-oriented team or burst-oriented assassins, going double Dorrance is not something to be ashamed of. It's very... Uh, very solid build. If you're versing a lot of early uh, magic damage bursts, sometimes when I'm versing like a Sinja or a Zoe, um, a Fizz, that sort of thing, setting on an early null magic mental is very effective. You can turn that into a Hex Drinker way later on. Don't feel necessary to upgrade it to Mercs. The MR difference between Mercs and Null Magic, is, I'm pretty sure it's actually zero. There's no difference. So don't feel baited to actually turn it into a, a Mercs. Just leave it on Null Magic and turn it into something way later on. You can even turn it into a Death Dance later on or a QSS or whatever you want to turn it into later. So don't feel pressured to turn it into a, into a Mercs. So um, not a fan of this build, but you know it, it might suit some of you out there. Now for the third build. This is actually my favorite build. And this is actually the crit build, and this is the most common or most popular Korean build at the moment. And the reason being is that it spikes earlier, it gives you an amazing amount of wave clear, its power troughs are way less obvious, um, because, you know, your high, your just base AD is incredibly high, so your wave clear is very nice. But it is less total AD in the long run, and as a six item build, it's not as strong as Muramana, obviously. But it feels like with Lucian, you can get so much done in the early to mid game, you don't need the scaling from Muramana. And obviously your culling is going to do a lot less damage. But we'll talk about one of the big benefits of the Essence River build, by the way, is that you don't need to take Presence of Mind in your runes. You can actually get away with Overheal. We'll talk about that in the runes a bit later on. Same thing, same premise with all these early, um, early items. My favorite's probably Corrupting Pot, especially when I'm going to be going Essence Reaver. You can go Longsword, and it can contribute towards this core field Hammer, but I'm just really not a fan of it. But same thing, you ideally want to be going for this BF Sword first. And because Lucian can really, um, I guess, stall out the early laning phase, BF Sword as a first item or first base is quite common. So anyway, first core item, Essence Reaver. Yes, you don't really get um, any attack speed. 
which is a little bit problematic, but you do get the CDR, you do get the mana region, you do get the base AD, so there is a lot of strengths to this build. And the burst damage on this build is very, very, very nice. And it's great for assassinating like enemy AD carries, that sort of thing. Essence Driver into IE, into a double zeal item here, generally like um, uh, Rapid Fire into a, into a PD, that sort of thing. You can even go Storm Razor if you want, but I'm just really not a fan of it. Um, that sort of thing. And again, round it off however you need to, depending on what you're trying to achieve in the mid to late game. So this is my, my go-to favorite build. Again, I would experiment with all these, see what feels best for you. And actually one thing I want to quickly talk about before we go on to the last build. If you are versing heavy frontline, I'm actually just not a fan of this build whatsoever because it just doesn't synergize well with any of these armor pen items. It feels like if I'm versing heavy frontline and the game's going to be a little bit more directed towards team fights, I will opt in for either the Essence Reaver build or this Mana Mune build. And it feels really nice to go uh, Last Whisper, uh, like an LDR or a Mortal Reminder with this build. It just feels like I can actually just shred through tanks incredibly well. And especially since I have a lot of attack speed, I'm going this double zero item later on in the game. And now for the final build, guys, is the Bork build. Now, this is probably my my least favorite build. It's, it's, it's just a very situational build. And now, the only situations you should be going the Bork build is when you're versing a lot of tanky, high HP stacking um, laners. So if you're versing like a set mid or something like that, or like a tank mid, then this is a very good build path. You generally will probably see this build path more in top laners when you're seeing like a top lane Lucian versus Shen or like a like a, a tanky Malphite or something like that, this is a very good build. The one redeeming factor is that, you, I mean, two redeeming factors is that you do get attack speed, you do get early lifesteal, which does allow you to farm camps okay, but the base AD is so low, and the main weakness of this build path, guys, is that your wave clear is so weak. And having low wave clear, because your Q won't actually one-shot the back line, is very, and that's actually very problematic as a mid laner. And that is actually one of the biggest strengths of Lucian with these other builds, is that you get incredible amount of priority, and you just don't get the same amount of priority with this build. And the other downside, by the way, with this build is that when it comes to mid-game, and you're trying to make picks or one-shot the enemy AD carry, you can't really do that. Your burst is so low on enemy squishies. So you want to avoid this build path if possible, but there are some games you do need to go down this route. Um, and one other redeeming factor is that it can help with culling, especially when you're doing like, you know, your EWing, auto attack, you proc your, you can actually use your active on the enemy. It slows them, speeds you up, which actually helps you land the culling more effectively. But same thing here, Essence River, IE into the rest of the build. So hopefully now you get a better understanding of how these builds work why you should alternate between all of them. I would experiment with all of them in differing situations. And it's very important to understand these build paths, guys, because this is actually one of the strengths of Lucian. You can cover for all your weaknesses in your kit, whatever you need. And we'll actually talk about this later in the guide, but um, if you have any more questions with itemization, just let me know, and um, I'll try and reply to as many comments as possible in the comment section. Now for Lucian's runes, guys, let's go over, first of all, the standard, stock standard Lucian rune page, PTA. PTA makes a lot of sense on Lucian. It's like an earlier spiking rune. Um, and the main reason is, is that Lucian can proc PTA incredibly fast because of his passive, you know, getting those extra autos in. He can proc it incredibly well. And the great thing with, with um, PTA in general, though, is that your kill threat is insane. You can, you know, you W auto or like E auto auto, or W whatever, get your, your PTA proc. Ideally, you want to be using W first. Like W, even if you have to W, E, auto, auto, um, you want to be procking your PTA as fast as possible, then using your culling and just running them down and just absolutely shredding them. So this in combination with culling is a ridiculous amount of kill threat. Now for the second row here, guys, um, your main options are present to mine or overheal. And it really depends on the build path you're going for. If you're going for mana immune build, you want to be going present to mine to get that extra mana, which gives you more AD. Um, uh, if you are going, um, the Essence Reaver build, you don't even you don't actually need Presence of Mind because you have so much mana or access to mana in the early portion of the game that you can actually have the luxury to go overheal, which is a very greedy rune, but if you can get away with it in mid-game, it is very noticeable, especially when you're in the side lane. Um, I personally, when going the um, when I'm going the Sanguine Blade build path, I will go Presence of Mind personally. But there are, uh, the guy that we're going to review today, he actually does go overheal because his theory is that I'm just going to dominate lane anyway. He plays very greedy style of League of Legends and it works for him. 
Um, and if you're going the Bork build, you probably want to be going Present to Mind. Now for the next row here, you never want to be going Legend Tenacity. You always want to be going either Legend Bloodline or Legend Alacrity. Legend Bloodline is very good when you're going uh, Mana Mune or if you're going the Essence Reaver build. Legend Bloodline just gives you that access to life steal without having to build it, which is incredibly important on Lucian. Um, for, for multitude of reasons, but mainly for the side lane. But Legend Alacrity, if you're going to go the Sanguine Blade build uh, route or the Bork um, route, because you already have Life Steal inbuilt within your items. And as for the final row here, guys, you basically want to be going Coup de Gras or Last Stand. I mean, sorry, or Cut Down. There are some top lane Lucians that go Last Stand, but I'm personally not a fan, and I don't really, I don't really see the point of it in mid lane since you should be dominating trades anyway. So Coup de Gras is the way to go, or Cut Down if you're versing heavy front line. Now for the secondary tree, Magical Footwear with Biscuits. You can also go, have seen a lot of Korean mid laners in fast-paced matchups go Time Warp Tonic with Corrupting Pot because of the access, or immediate access to... Uh, resources. I personally think it's a bit overkill. You don't really need it. I just think Magical Footwear Biscuits is the best of the way to go. Biscuits are just great on Lucian in general though because um, it gives you flexibility within the laning phase. It gives you more access to resources which can allow you to play more aggressively. Worst case scenario, you don't need them. You can sell them. Increases your max mana pool, that sort of thing. Now, in terms of this section, it's actually important to understand there is more and more Lucians going double adaptive. Chovy pretty much only goes double adaptive. And I guess the theory is, I think my, I was actually talking to another friend who was telling me, Ruler says the same thing. Because your, your all-ins are all about the combos and just raw damage, you get a lot of value from just having the most amount of attack damage as possible. I was talking to another Lucian player, and their theory was that if you're versing a ranged champion, it's very unlikely that you're going to get an extra auto off on the enemy, even if you have the attack speed shard. So you're just better off getting the extra AD damage for that early burst, Q poke, that sort of thing. If you're versing a melee champion, though, where you are going to get a lot of auto attacks off, having one row of attack speed makes a lot more sense because you probably will be able to get an extra auto attack off because they're so low range and you're you're in auto attack range so often. And attack speed, having attack speed does scale better than having uh, a double adaptive force. So keep that in mind. Experiment with both of them. I'm actually starting to lean towards double adaptive, but see what works for you personally. Now, the other page you should kind of understand here, guys, is that if you are want to play, if you do want to play like an absolute psycho, you want to take Ignite, you want to go for those early solo kills, you can go Nimbus and Absolute Focus. Absolute Focus does actually make a lot of sense with Lucian because you're going to be high HP a lot. You're going to have a lot of, um, you know, you're going to be taking a lot of favorable trades. This increases your early all-in significantly. And on top of that, it actually does increase your wave clear breakpoint in terms of when you can one-shot the back line with your Q. That is very important. And the reason Nimbus Cloak is um, you're going to be you know, walking in, igniting them, and this can actually help it, help you land that culling as well, So and chasing down your opponent. So this is a very solid Q, aggressive Chad, aggressive uh, a room page. I wouldn't really recommend this if you're an, a, a beginner, Lucian, but it is an option out there. And another style of playing Lucian, I have seen people just go like Nimbus Cloak and Transcendence, or even Transcendence Gathering Storm, which does tie into that theory of using your early game strength to scale. But I personally personally just like the access to boots, saving that 300 gold so I can put it towards my first item and have the access to uh, biscuits for just flexibility in terms of how I want to use my resources in the early game. Now for summoners, guys, very important to understand, Exhaust is the best summoner for Lucian. It's the most reliable summoner. It's great for both offensive and defensive purposes. Because Lucian is a relatively low range champion, you are going to get a lot of people diving onto you. You're going to verse champions like Rengars, Fizzes, Zeds, Camilles, Fioras that are getting in your face. And Exhaust can turn the tides of those 1v1s allows you to be incredibly annoying to kill. And the, and the, the, the most annoying thing about Exhaust, guys, is think about your, just think about your laning phase. You're dominating your laning phase. They can't take short trades with you because you're just, you'll just win those short trades. The only way people are going to kill you majority of the time is go for an aggressive all-in. And if you hold your Exhaust and exhaust that initial all-in, you're very hard to kill. So Exhaust... I believe you should be taking it at least 90% of the time, and it's a must-take versus bursts, 
versus assassins and divers. If you do want to play like a psycho, or maybe you're smurfing, or, <laughs> or whatever you're doing, or you feel like you're just extremely confident in Lucian, you can take Ignite and play like an absolute psycho. Um, if you're in a very good matchup, if you want to solo kill, if you're taking Ignite, guys, your intention should be to solo kill, solo kill sorry, in the first 7 to 8 minutes of the game. If you're taking Ignite and not getting a solo kill in the first 7 to 8 minutes, it's useless. You might as well just take Exhaust. Um, so yeah, synergizes with that chat aggressive identity. And then lastly, guys, for obvious reasons, if you're versing Heavy CC, you're versing things like Galio, Lissandra, Twisted Fate, then Cleanse is the way to go. Now for some Lucian landing phase advice, guys. So the first point here, if you're versing a champion with a skill shot level 1, something like an Orianna, or a Syndra, or a Zerath, start E, because you want to be dodging that initial skill shot and, you know, getting those extra autos off. Otherwise, you should be starting Q. And at level 3, guys, you should be putting 2 points Q, not a point in W, because the wave locations like going to be so close to the enemy's tower that you're not going to be able to chase them down and utilize that extra movement speed anyway now the next point here guys is that level one you should be looking to walk past the wave and zone the enemy away from xp even if it comes at the sacrifice of you missing cs and i'm actually going to show you an example on the next slide of me doing this so sit tight but in order to do this strategy guys you should have either longsword and three pots because you will be likely taking aggro from the enemy range creeps or Corrupting Pot. And this actually ties into that heavy trading style of playing Lucian, and especially when you're versing laners that are taking a Doran's item, this is a very effective way of creating a resource advantage in the early portion of the lane. Now, it is quite difficult to execute, so if you are a beginner, I wouldn't recommend doing this at level one, and I will kind of show both ways to play the level one, and I will talk about this more within the community Q&A section later on within the video. Now, in terms of what to do with the waves in the early portion of the lane, I'm going to show you what the options actually are. Now, don't worry, I'm going to show you plenty of examples, but I want to explain to you the theory behind what I'm about to show you. The first options. So, if you're versing an early ganking jungle, you either have to ward as you are slow building the second wave, or you ward as the second wave crashes under tower. If you're versing a full clear jungle though, you have the luxury to slow build three waves and harass the enemy under tower while leaning and warding before those three waves crash under the tower. Now number two guys, if you're versing an ignite or combat spell user, whether it's a cleanse or an exhaust or a heal or something like that, you should look to bounce the wave and set up a gank opportunity or all-in opportunity. Because if you're versing a TP user, you're not really going to have that luxury because the enemy can just heavy trade with you once, come back with full resources with a pink ward, lean to one side and it's going to be very difficult for you to set up a gank on that tp user so if you are versing a tp user you need to keep them more interested and continue to kind of slow push waves into them keeping them low keeping them interested and keeping your wave very manageable you can't let the wave get too big um, and this way they're going to be stuck in lane for a very long time and likely you'll generate a lot of kill threat as you near level 6. And don't worry, we're going to show plenty of examples of these situations, so sit tight. Now for Lucian laning strategy post first base, guys. So here are the options post first base. Number 1, you should always be looking to slow build waves. And when you're slow building waves, bait abilities, and after you've baited the abilities, E forward for a chunk and aggressive trade, either with auto attacks or culling. And I'm going to show you an example in a second, but ideally, let's just say, you know, this is the enemy tower here, this is the enemy champion, and this is... Actually, let's, let's move more up here. Let's actually say they're further up in the lane. This is me, and this is my tower. What I'll actually do first is say this is like a Syndra or something like that. Syndra Q's on the ground. As soon as Syndra Q's on the ground, and I'll like maybe baited that Q by walking quite aggressively, I'll E forward past the Q or maybe to the side and look for an aggressive trade, knowing that I have plenty of room to chase down. I can either W, then R, um, you know, proc that PTA before I R ideally and get a really, really good chunk. Now, in this situation, after they're chunked or as the slow built wave crashes, they either have to recall because they're so chunked out and they don't want to, you know, die under tower in which they lose a lot of CS and plates or you turn on target champions only and you just mow them down with your ultimate auto attacks and your ignite. Worst case scenario, the enemy jungle actually comes and protects them from the dive, and then you've just drawn pressure from the enemy jungle. Yes, you don't really get many plates, or you can't really get a solo kill, but still, they're sharing CS at least, or sharing XP anyway, and you're relieving pressure from the rest of the map. Now, keep in mind, guys, with Lucian, Lucian has complete wave control, and the ability to... He can slow build waves whenever he wants, he can hard push on command, and this is... 
one of the actually one of the most overlooked strengths of Lucian as a mid laner. It's very rare that a champion has complete and utter lane control. They can slow build perfectly. They can hard push perfectly. That is such an amazing strength of a champion. And it's actually why Lucian's so annoying to verse. Because you know, as soon as you base, he can one-shot the wave, maybe get one or two plates, or he can slow build waves, poke you on the tower. It's very annoying to verse. Now, I did mention this before in the itemization section, but if you do go Dirk, at level 6 with Cullen, you can nearly one-shot the enemy jungle, and they very rarely expect it. Now what we're going to do is actually look at a few examples of these concepts that I've just reiterated to try and get the information across in a very practical manner. So in this vod here, guys, I want to show you my attempt of walking past the wave level 1 versus a Kale. So as you see here, I walk past the wave a little bit. I get my Q, doesn't draw minion aggro. Then I actually walk up past the wave. And now my intention here, what I'm trying to do is actively zone this Kale from being in XP range. Yes, I'm not going to be able to walk back and get these CS myself, but XP is much more valuable than gold. 60 gold isn't as meaningful as literally KO not being able to hit level 2 as, this, as the built wave crashes. And this actually means, it's actually more of like a long-term investment. It actually makes it very difficult for KO to CS under tower and allows me to bully much harder on the second and third wave. Uh, and it also makes a meaningful difference because I'm going to get level 6 way earlier than Kale, which can actually um, force her to get caught off guard, which is another little thing. And, and people usually do this in bot lane. It's not a scene as much in mid lane because it's very difficult to do. But that's basically the premise here. And I don't do it perfectly, but I just wanted to show you the theory behind it. And, by the way, if you auto the Kale here as these range creeps um, actually attack or throw their auto attack or their little laser beam, you actually don't draw minion, minion aggro, which is a bit of a bug, and they probably will fix it, but I do want to show you it here. I do it for the first auto, but not the second auto. So here, you'll notice I get my, my auto off on this KO, and it doesn't draw minion aggro. Look at that. The minions just ignore me. And then KO walks up a little bit more, and I don't time my auto, and then the minions actually turn around and attack me which actually prevents Kale from getting zoned from all the XP, and Kale only loses one minion worth of XP, which is, you know, it's noticeable, but ideally it should be the first three completely. Because if I do this perfectly and time my autos with these caster creeps, just watch it again. Watch where my first auto goes through. It's actually as the, the, the animation was in transit like that, and then this next auto, it's actually not at all. So if you can master this skill, you can actually get massive leads, massive, massive leads, because then these casters would continue to auto attack these, these melee creeps. Kale would get zoned from all three of these this XP, and then I would be very, very far ahead. And on top of this, I've got Corrupting Pot. So even if we take a heavy trade here, even in the worst case scenario like this, where I take a, I take a lot of damage from the range creeps, I'm quite happy because I have Corrupting Pot and... Um, it's not the end of the world for me. So it's the exact same premise with Longsword 3 pots as well. So keep that in mind when I'll experiment with it. If you're a high elo player, it would be something that I would recommend to do. So in this clip here, guys, I want to show you the classic Lucian post 6 all-in play that is very reliable and you'll probably find yourself in this situation most games. So when you're post 6, ideally I would have Dirk in this situation, but my early game didn't go too well because I missed a lot of CS and I didn't start Longsword. I actually started... Uh, D-Blade, which is, I, I mentioned this in the itemization section, this actually significantly hurts my level 6 item spike, but anyway, I'm looking to slow build waves into this immobile mage, because if I slow build waves, then I can harass under tower, I can get more plates, we can control objectives easier, I can get better division, I can just do everything better. Now, most immobile mages, they're going to be too scared or, or unable to prevent me from slow building waves because if they disrespect me, I've got all this room to chase down the enemy. I've got a gap closer, I've got my W I can land on them, my culling, I have a lot of burst damage. They can't stop me from slow building waves. So ideally, my goal is here, I walk past the wave and zone them and actually prevent them from, from ruining my slow build. But if they don't, if they don't respect me, I can just go for an all-in kill. So here in this situation, Oriana doesn't respect me. Um, QW, and I get a nice little Q poke through the wave here, and then Oriana cues me, and that's how Oriana cues me, I just W forward, uh, and my W actually doesn't even hit here, she does a really good job of dodging it, but then I can just chase down and all in. So, that's generally what you want to be looking to do, either slow build, and if they don't respect, you can go for that all in kill. Now, what I want to show you guys in this clip is my levels 1 to 6 laning phase versus a high elo Katarina player. Now, this Katarina, I believe, is like rank 3 or rank 4 on our server, high elo Katarina 1 trick. And I think that I play this entire early lane very, very well. And I think 
it'd be great to show you all of the things that I've mentioned so far in this video in a very practical example. So let's actually just go through the levels one to six, me playing this game and really talk about some of the concepts here. So what I do here, level one, is instead of walking past the wave and doing that very aggressive approach here, um, I just auto attack one of the creeps, making one of them obviously lower. And then I kind of just look to harass, maybe queue through the wave. Ideally, I try to avoid queuing through the range creeps because then it pushes the wave too fast. And I want to, you know, ideally slow build as many waves as possible into this cat arena. Um, so I do this pretty stock standard. I did a terrible queue through that range creep because I tried to get a bit of poke off. She walks up. I end up procking that PTA and getting a nice little chunk here. But again, you can see how I'm trying to walk past the wave as much as I can. Deny CS. I'm not queuing too much because I don't want to push too fast. But I really am trying to generate threat, maybe even zone this Katarina off a bit of XP here. I actually zone Cat off the a range creep of XP there, which is very nice. Usually, if they disrespect, you can just E forward for a really, really nice chunk like this. Get a nice, really nice chunk again, because she's trying to get into XP range. And this is the strength of slow building waves as well. And you can generally do this um, in most matchups. Now, I use this opportunity off the, the first two waves to get a bit of vision so I can lean onto one side. Canarina basically one-shots the wave. I get another nice little Q here. Now I can lean safely to one side knowing I can't get ganked. I put two points Q because I don't feel like I need the access to my W. I miss another Q. And one thing what you'll realize, guys, the higher the quality of the Lucian plays, the more Qs they will hit in the lane phase. Their Q accuracy will be very, very high. Now... This is generally what happens to a certain extent in the laning phase. So I've, I've got a decent amount of poke. This Katarina was now first forced to use two entire health pots already off the first three waves, which I'm quite happy with. Now, the wave didn't really properly bounce, but the way Katarina played, because she was so panicked in terms of having to clear the wave so I couldn't harass her on a tower, the wave would have looked like this regardless. Whether it bounced or whether it didn't bounce, it's going to come back to me. Now, I've got... I'm versing a champion with a combat spell. I believe she has Ignite. And I have an early ganking jungle. So I ideally want to bounce the wave back and generate kill threat onto this Katarina. Now, when I'm in this situation, like I said before, off the bounce wave, either I can zone them, and Katarina is a bit tricky because she does, she has such a strong level 3, but she should be incredibly scared of the enemy jungle in which it will be hard for her to break this freeze or break this temporary, this temporarily, um, this temporary wave location. So anyway, I'm trying to thin the wave, keep it manageable. I don't want to let Katarina actually get the wave in completely, but she's really trying to brute force this wave, but taking a lot of bad trades in the process. So I'm very happy with the way this is going. Olaf kind of shows his face here a little bit. Because my jungle showed topside, even though I think Elise should have actually been ganking mid, not top. And I could have done a better job of pinging Katarina maybe. But um, the premise still remains the same. Now, the great thing about the strategy, guys, when you let them come out, you're going to be able to slow build a wave back. And this is what I end up doing. Notice how I'm only last hitting now because I know that I can slow build a wave. Slow building is always the way to go with Lucian. Now I can play very aggressively. I can kind of walk past the wave a little bit, make it very difficult for Katarina to thin the wave and prevent me from slow pushing. And as you get better jungles and you communicate with your pings, whether you're duo, whether you're high elo, whatever, your jungles will utilize your slow builds to either deny the enemy CS or even straight up dive them. So I'm getting some nice Q poke here. And my jungle sees that I'm slow building a wave here. And we can deny the Katarina a lot of CS. And I haven't even perfectly CS in this lane. Like, my CS is okay, but I have missed a lot of CS here. So now I'm just slow building, and I know that I have to shove this one because the one before it, um, I want to crash this wave before the next one comes because I know I can't stack another wave, and I don't want it to just die out front of the tower. And I know this because I'm keeping tabs on my wave location coming out of my base right now. So then I crash this wave knowing my jungle's in the area, and then my jungle helps me deny all of this CS. She's forced to shampoo away. And this Katarina basically can't see us under tower. And regardless, even if my jungle maybe just got vision for me, or even if I watered to one side, as long as I had vision on one side, I can largely make it very difficult for the enemy to see us um, on all of these creeps under tower. Like the bigger the wave, the harder it is for them to see us perfectly because they have to put themselves in a vulnerable position um, and get poked by me. So this early lane is going very, very well. And as you see in a second, we've pretty much denied all of this farm. And if we fast forward just a touch here, I get the next wave, knowing the next wave after this is a cannon, because you always want to be looking to base as the next wave as a cannon. 
because I don't have teleport, I want to make sure I'm getting as much tempo on my resets as possible. And then I look to recall here. Now looking at the CS, it's 42 to 13 CS. Okay, so this is generally what you can replicate, you know, doing. This is versus a pretty high elo Katarina, rank 3 on our server or whatever. And most Katarinas or most mid laners aren't going to be that good. And I haven't really done anything special. Just basic wave manipulation, basic warding, basic jungle tracking, nothing too fancy. You can replicate these sorts of leads in the mid lane. Now for some Lucian must know tips, guys. So the first one, shorter distance E's are important for farming jungle camps and max damage output. And I will show you this actually in an example in a second. Using W before R increases accuracy because you get the movement speed and it's easier to really line up that culling. Also, try to proc PTA before using R for insane solo kill threat. And remember guys, I actually learned this yesterday, is that other people can proc W movement speed for you. So let's just say maybe you're too scared to engage the fight and you just kind of want to wait for your jungle to start the fight and create space for you. You can just EW max range and if your jungle auto attacks or attacks the enemy, then you actually get the movement speed. So then you can join the fight easier and close that gap. And I actually didn't know that. So that's actually very important for skirmishes, team fights, and all ins when other people are involved um, in that situation. And the correct max or combo for max damage, guys, is W auto attack, E auto attack, Q auto attack. And the theory being, guys, is that if the passive auto from the W lands before you E, you get the extra CDR towards the E on top of it, so your overall E cooldown is lower. Go to practice tool, practice it. I'm going to show you in a second what it looks like. Hold on. And make sure, guys, W first is great because of both the move speed and procs PTA quicker for other abilities. Because you ideally want to utilize PTA through your other abilities, like your Q and things like that. So it's better to use your W first with auto attacking and get that, that P, uh, PTA proc through your W in auto attack, E auto attack, rather than Q first. Because, um, yeah, again, you're getting less damage on your Q, which is actually a major portion of your, of your burst damage. Uh, another point here, guys, view your E as if it's a ZW or a Fizz E or a Syndra E. And I spoke about this a lot in my other videos, but the best players, say the best Zs, they don't just view Z and ZW in a very one-dimensional fashion. The way they view ZW is it's not only a gap-closing ability, it's a way to dodge the enemy's ability. So there's multiple dimensions in which you should view the ability. You shouldn't just use um, Lucian E to close the gap. You've got to think, okay... How can I both maximize my damage with closing the gap here and simultaneously avoid them from hurting me? So either you're timing your E to dodge or you're waiting for them to use an ability and then using it to the side or just going straight forward. There's a lot of ways to use it, but make sure you're just not viewing it in a very one-dimensional way. And there are two ways to view Lucian culling. There's control versus kill threat. And I actually had a conversation with that Lucian player about this because I kind of agree, kind of disagree, and I kind of feel like it's up to interpretation. But it is something to, under, to try and understand. So, hear me out here. There is two types of using ultimates in the laning phase. You've got the Orianna ultimate and the Victor ultimate. Like, they're like this in the same vein where you use them largely not to finish someone off, but you use them in the laning phase to get a lot of control for a big chunk. So, they either lose CS, they have to recall, you can get a tempo reset, that sort of thing. So, largely, if you watch my Orianna video, I, just, I don't just hold on to my ultimate for ages. I'll just use it for a great trade. Same for Victor. Now, on the other hand, you've got Zed Ultimate, where Zed Ultimate, his entire identity and his kit revolves around solo kills, right? So if you just use your ultimate and ignite for like a chunk, it's not that valuable because you really need to get those solo kills and it's the threat of having ultimates that actually creates space and allows you to navigate the laning phase. So you don't just use Zed Ultimate for chunk. Now, I'm conflicted about the way you should interpret Lucian culling. I've seen Lucians doing two ways. Sometimes I use Lucians just for chunk and control, so then they actually just get a bunch of um, control over the lane, chunk them out, force so that they can't really catch a CS under tower, so you get a bunch of plates and get a CS lead. But I've also seen Lucians hold onto the culling and use it for genuine kill threat where... Because um, if you use that Lucian Culling, they know that you can't chase them down anymore. They know that it's going to be hard for them to die under tower. And they probably don't have to respect as much. They can kind of heal up that sort of thing. So I would experiment with both ways. My hunch, though, is that you should be using it for control. Just use it for a chunk. Make them very low. And ideally, you do it in combination with slow building waves. So like I showed in that clip before when I'm playing Lucian versus Orianna. Let's just say Orianna escapes that all-in and doesn't die. Worst case scenario, she's very low. I mean, best case scenario, sorry, she's very low. 
and then I, yes, I don't get this. Oh, sorry, worst case scenario, she don't, I don't get the kill. But then I just one shot the wave, crash it under tower. Oriana had the base, and I deny her like two whole waves, and I get a, a plate to myself. So either way, it's a win-win. I get the solo kill, or um, they have to flash and lose a bunch of CS, and that's the strength of Lucian's absolute control over the wave. So what I'm going to do now is show you what the max damage combo looks like. So you guys can go ahead and practice tool and actually really refine it, guys. So here is what the max damage combo looks like, making sure you're getting that extra CDR on that E, as well as having a short distance E to get the max damage output in a shortest period of time possible. And you can just finish it off with R, then you can cancel the R auto attack and get an extra E on top of that. So that's exactly what it looks like. And this is what you should try to do in practice tool. And then let's fast forward again, do it with flash to show you what it looks like if you want to weave in flash as well. And ideally, you want to be using attack move to um, when you're doing the short E because otherwise it's very, very difficult to, um, to get those auto attacks off in the shortest possible time. So hopefully, that's what it looks like. Strive towards that. Go into practice tool. Get practicing those combos until you can do that smoothly. I mean, you're still going to be good. You can still be fine at Lucian even if you can't do the combo smoothly. But this is what's going to really take you to the next level. So when to pick Lucian, guys. So if you want to have reliable success with Lucian, you should try to pick Lucian when you have AP in the jungle, not in other roles. This is because of the effectiveness of Tarbis versus Lucian and how much Seekers can actually influence and affect that 2v2 strength in the mid jungle. So ideally, you're playing with champs like Evelyn, Elise, Karthus, and those tank junglers like Sejuani and Zac. Yes, you can also play Lucian when you have like a, you know, AP in the top lane and the bot lane, things like that. But you'll have the most success if it's within the jungle because 2v2 mid jungle strength is very important with Lucian specifically. Now, because Lucian is all about the laning phase, guys, you don't really need to worry about any other any other thing within the composition. You don't need to worry about range or CC or burst or whatever because Lucian's items and flexible build paths can cover for all of those weaknesses. Right? And this is actually incredibly rare in League of Legends. There's basically no other mid-champion that can solve all of their problems through itemization. Do you need range? Go rapid fire. You need early spiking? Go sanguine. You need tank shred? Go bork. You need scaling? Go man immune. You need protection from burst? Go PD or GA. You need MR? Go hex drinker or more. CC removal? QSS? Protection from poke? You get liar steal from bork? BT or death dance? All of these items can cover for Lucian's weaknesses. It's, it's no, there's barely any other champion in the game that can actually do this. This is actually one of the main reasons why Lucian is such a blindable, effective champion within solo queue. So now for Lucian counters. So I've had a thousand questions from you guys in the community asking Curtis, what counters Lucian? How do I beat Lucian? What do I pick into him? What's his counters? That sort of thing. So I've gone ahead and done a slide breaking down what you guys can pick into Lucian mid lane. The way I'm actually doing this slide is, is I'm actually separating them into three skill levels. If you're a moderately skilled mid laner around like maybe gold platinum, these are the two champs I would recommend. If you're a higher skill, maybe diamond plus or high diamond, you can also play a Zir and Zoe. If you're a grandmaster plus mid laner, you can also experiment with Callista mid lane, which is the, actually the hardest counter to Lucian mid lane. But let's actually go ahead and start with Syndra and Akali. And first of all, Syndra. Now, Syndra doesn't really win 1v1, but she can completely nullify Lucian mid lane. You're never going to die to Lucian ever. You can farm 10 CS or like at least 8 to 10 CS per minute. You can scale very well into mid game. Take that scaling mid lane Syndra approach with Phase Rush, um, Ludens or GOP, whatever you want to go and do your job uh, very easily. Now, the reason being is that Syndra has high range, low cooldowns and reliable CC. And this is important because... If you always hold your E as Syndra, Lucian can never dash aggressively and take extended trades onto you. If Lucian ever dashes forward, you can just respond with a QEW, run away with phase rush, or even just QE auto, run away with phase rush, and he can never actually chase you down, never get extended trades, and you can easily nullify this matchup. And if you're incredibly scared, you can even go arm guard if need be. I personally just like going lost chapter, sitting maybe on an early cloth armor, 
Then I actually have a lot of threat onto Lucian if he doesn't build an early Null Magic Mantle post first base. And most Lucians actually won't build Null Magic Mantle, and you can actually nearly one-shot him if you farm very well. So keep that in mind. So a very solid matchup for nullifying this matchup. And as long as you are not using your E aggressively and you're playing proactively reactive, that's the way I like to call it, proactively re reactive. So you're not just holding onto E because you're bad. You're holding onto E because you have a plan. You know that that will, that will actually prevent Lucian from trading onto you. So don't get... Don't feel like you're just going even, it's bad going even and scaling. That's actually just not the case. It's a very solid matchup into Lucian, especially heading into mid game. Now, Akali. Akali's a bit different. It's, it's good in a different way. It feels like if the Lucian is extremely good, Lucian will win this matchup, right? If the Lucian versus Akali matchup for Lucian has an infinite skill cap. Like, if you're Faker, like, you're nearly always going to win this matchup as Lucian, but. There is so much room for error on Lucian's behalf that if Akali gets in range once with a Q or lands an E randomly or or Lucian has no mana or uses his dash aggressively post 6 and keeps himself overextended in the lane, because Lucian has no hard CC, there is actually no way of keeping Akali off you. Um, so Akali is actually a very good pick at generating a lot of threat, and you can just take Fleet Full Work, D Shield, Resolve Secondary, minimize the entire early lane, get to 6, look for that burst kill, or if Lucian d like dies to a single gank, or your jungle comes once, and you even blow Lucian's Flash and, and Exhaust, he's going to die the next time your ultimate's up. So it's actually a very good matchup, because you have a ridiculous amount of threat onto Lucian. In low elo, I think this would be a very good response. In high elo, a little bit harder to pull off, because the Lucians will be much better at tethering, utilizing the Q range, that sort of thing, but it is a decent response. You're not going to win 1v1, but you can, there is a lot of potential to win 1v1. Now, Azir at the highest level actually wins this matchup because he can actually just put his, his soldiers out, he can proc lethal tempo once, keep shoving the wave, make it very difficult for Lucian to get into a, into a location to chase Azir down, and if, if Lucian dashes forward, all Azir has to do is put one soldier there, he can even E to get a shield, and just Lucian's going to be in the middle of the wave, and Azir with the attack speed, and if Azir takes Exhaust, he actually wins the 1v1. Azir actually wins the 1v1, so it's a high skill cap matchup. If, you're in a, if you are an Azir player, this is a solid matchup. I would recommend it, but if you're like below Diamond, then I wouldn't even touch it. Zoe is good in a different way, again, because Zoe has Bubble, similar to Syndra. If you hold your bubble, Lucian can never E onto you aggressively. It's very difficult for Lucian to take those very aggressive trades. So then Lucian has to resort to just Q poke, which is fine, but that is really limiting Lucian's options in the early portion of the lane. And then you're going even, and then you actually force Lucian to take cleanse, in which he's not taking exhaust or ignite, which severely hurts his 1v1 threat and side laning. So overall, it's a very good matchup at nullifying. And Zoe's actually better in 2v2s and gank setup, that sort of thing. So if you are a good Zoe player, it is a very solid matchup. Um, again, if you build Lost Chapter, you have an incredible amount of threat onto the Lucian. Now, Callista. Callista is the hardest counter to Lucian. It's very, very difficult for Lucian to do anything because with Halo Blades... He wins, Callista wins all the all-in, the all-in trades, all of the short trades. Callista can actually dodge the Lucian's Q quite easily with those with those dashes all the time. Um, there's basically nothing that Lucian can do. He loses trades at all point in time. So, um, very good matchup for Callista. The main reason we don't see it as much is because Callista is a very hard champion to play. And um, not many people are comfortable enough to play solo lane Callista. In China... You see it quite often, like the Shy, Shy plays it, things like that. But um, other than that, if you're not very comfortable mechanically, I would not recommend playing this pick. Um, but if you can, then free win for you, essentially. Now, Lucian team fighting, very important to understand. And this is a principle that I try to follow. And that Lucian player that I spoke to, he also kind of follows this same principle. If you can auto attack in a team fight, always auto attack. But if you can't auto attack, then you go and default to using your W in your R. So ideally, if you can't auto attack, your combo would then be W, R, then you get into range, auto attack, E, auto attack. So try and follow that principle when team fighting. Don't just randomly use culling if you can always auto attack. Ideally, though, in like mid to late game and when it comes to team fighting, ideally you want to chunk someone before the fight. And you can do this by chunking people coming in from the side lane. And we're actually going to show this in one of the VODs we're going to go over today. And utilizing your Sanguine Blade. Or shoving sides and moving to fights, creating those man advantage fights. Now, 
If you do build rapid fire cannon, it can be very good for getting chunks. Because all you have to do, once you have your rapid fire available, just W the air. Then you walk at them with your rapid fire double auto attack. Um, and then E auto attack. You can get a very, very good chunk before the fight even starts. Now, you need to adapt to the composition. If you have divers on your team comp, you can complement them and sit off to the side and one-shot the enemy AD carry. Conversely, you can play the front-to-back team fight and shred the front line. Uh, this is actually what makes Lucian such a flexible champion, especially when heading into mid to late game. And another point you need to understand is once you have two crit items, it is worth cancelling the culling for auto attacks. So let's just say, you know, um, you're going for an all-in, you're going to use your culling. If you do have, like, say, Essence Reaver IE, you will do more damage with the auto attacks. But it's rare you'll ever be in this situation because likely you've already got them low enough with auto attacks or... Um, you're just kiting back with culling in which you don't really want to stop your culling and then you're just going to finish them off anyway with auto attacks after the culling ends completely. So um, you're not really going to find yourself in that situation too often. Now, advice for learning Lucian. If you're interested in learning this champion, this is what I'd recommend. Utilize practice tool. If you're learning Lucian, you need to be able to, to consistently not cancel auto attacks with 40% CDR doing the proper full combo mentioned in that previous slide beforehand. You should also look to alternate builds in practice tool because you're going to get you got to get used to changes in attack speed. You're going to go the Sanguine Blade sometimes or the Bork build. Other games you're going to be going Essence Reaver. Some games you're going to be going the Mana Mune build in, in which you have no attack speed. Other builds you have high attack speed. You need to get very comfortable with doing the combos with differing types of attack speed. And this is actually what I struggle with personally because I alternate between all the builds and it can get a little bit problematic micro-wise. So actually, go into practice tool, try change the builds, try the combo, that sort of thing. And note, it will be very normal to int with Lucian mid lane because of how much power you're gonna, you're gonna feel and how much power you have over the enemy in the lane. So make sure you're pushing your limits, but you have to find that perfect balance of controlled aggression. That's what you're after. You know, getting that poke down, focusing on your CS, but not playing too aggressively. You're not playing like a Time Warp Tonic Biscuits, Electrocute, Zoe, but you're not playing like a full scaling Velkos or Zerith. You've got to find that mixture in between. But keep in mind, guys, if you die in the early game, you are most likely screwed for the entire game. So keep that in mind. It's a very Feast or Famine champion. And note... The biggest mistake I see with Lucian players, even in myself, is the incorrect usage of E. Remember, it's your only form of self-peel because you don't have any CC. So if someone can close the gap onto you, you need to be very careful with the way you use your E, both in terms of dodging key abilities. If you're even attacking the tower, be very careful if you're using E to utilize your passive under tower because then you have no self-peel. And I've died many a times by using E on the wave and then the enemy all ins me or I get ganked or whatever happens, just be very conscious of when and where you can use your E. Very, very important. Now we're going to go over a VOD, guys. We're going to do VOD review time. Um, we're actually going to go over a game from this Lucian player on our server, and I'm actually going to link his Twitch. If you're interested in seeing more Lucian gameplay, he plays a bit of Twitch, sorry, a bit of Lucian on his Twitch channel. I'll link it in the description below. And we're going to be highlighting this specific style with the Sanguine Blade. He had an average game here. It's not the perfect game, but it was one of his recent games off his Twitch. He went 9.1 CS this game. Um, he actually died in the early game from a gank slash solo kill. He had a very early, rough early game. But what I love about this VOD is it really shows the strength of Sanguine Blade. It really shows that strategy where he gets a lot of plates. He goes into the side lane, picks people in transition, one-shots people in the side lane, that sort of thing. Farms jungle camps. So I think it really highlights the strengths of this specific setup. So let's go ahead and dive into the VOD, guys. And then after this, after this VOD, we're gonna go into the community Q&A, so um, stay tuned. Now, diving into this VOD here, guys, we have Lucian into Zerath mid lane. This VOD isn't the best showing mechanically, but it really does highlight and show a lot of the mid lane fundamentals for Lucian and this specific strategy. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what happens in this lane. Because Zerath is uh, largely a skill shot oriented champion, we should see level one E, not Q. Um, and one thing to highlight here, guys, is that he did start Longsword 3 Pots, which is good into poke-oriented matchups for two reasons. One, obviously, you have a lot more sustain with 3 Pots, so if you get poked, it's not as meaningful. And it also allows you to get to Vam Scepter much faster, and life still as a stat, is very good into poke-oriented matchups. So he auto-attacks one of the, the melee creeps to make it, obviously, um, CSable. And then he walks up past the wave, auto, then E auto to get their PTA proc. Very smart, and... Um, 
gets a very nice trade level one. And I love how he's standing outside the wave and making Xerath make a choice between him and the wave because then um, you're going to be able to build a much bigger wave and slow building waves as Lucian is the name of the game. So then you can, you know, get more damage under tower, get plenty of vision, that sort of thing, and make it very difficult for the enemy to see us under tower. So anyway here, he's about to hit level 2, so we'll see if he actually hits the Q through the minion. So he does another aggressive level 1 trade, procking that PTA, always autoing first, then E-auto to make sure he gets the full, uh, the full PTA proc. And uh, auto cancel. And then he gets Q here, misses it through the creeps. Not too bad though, still adding a lot of pressure. Already forced one pot out of this Zerath. Gets one auto onto the tower. Now he should be definitely be looking to ward here. Wards to one side. Built those two ways into warding. Now, generally in this situation, off the bounce wave, like we said, we have a few options. If this person doesn't take TP, generally you want to be, you know, letting the wave come out a little bit, creating a lot of kill threat, and setting gank, you know, creating a gank opportunity onto this, onto this laner. If you're versing someone with TP, then you kind of want to keep them a little bit more interested. Um, you know, get let the wave come out, but manage it, make sure it doesn't get ridiculously big, and then look to slow build waves back into this person, making it, making it very difficult for the enemy to find a recall opportunity. Be because Zerath is a champion that actually has a lot of wave clear from a long range, and because he's also versing a Nunu jungle and has an Echo jungle, I think he actually plays this in a way where he doesn't bounce the wave fully, and he actually thins the wave quite a lot because he feels like Zerath might just be able to crash the wave too easily. So I believe he actually thins the wave quite a lot here, which does make sense because, again, Zerath can quite easily break this, um, prevent this from... Um, freezing. So it looks like he's going to build up another slow build, another slow push. That's what I'm assuming here. Trying to look for an aggressive trade here. Ends up screwing up his E, but does proc that PTA and get another Q auto. Massive damage. Look at that. So he gets the, he gets the, what does he get here? He gets an auto. What does he do first? So he's autos, E, auto, auto, procs PTA. Now you want to do, be doing damage to utilize the PTA. Q auto, look how much damage that does. And the wave's coming out to him, so it'll be interesting to see what he does, because Zerath does not have, have TP here. And Nunu does have solid early ganks. And notice how those three pots really come in handy. All that sustain. Okay, so he's not... Ah, oh, okay, what happened here? Oh, so Echo gank top, so he knew he wasn't going to get a gank mid, so he's actually trying to keep Zerath interested. Keep the wave manageable, so if Zerath does choose to recall, he can just instantly shove the wave and base himself. He still has a biscuit here. He did put two points Q, by the way, level three. So keep, that's another thing I did highlight in the video. Remember that. So trying to keep Zerath interested here. He's in a pretty good lane state. Zerath has no more pots. Gets, lands a nice Q here. Dodges. Oh. Did he die? No. Okay. So let's take a look at this. So he dodges the... Dodges the... Gets a Q. Dodges the E. Or... Wait, does he auto after he flashes? So he auto E, flash auto, W auto. Oh, and the auto doesn't go through because of the flash. Just survives. And the exhaust. If the exhaust came out a little bit later, probably would have killed him. But um, really good play there. Unfortunately, he can't punish. He's probably just going to recall here. He probably just has to recall for a vamp scepter. Recalls for a Vamp Scepter here. So he's 27 CS to 17. Could have been a lot better if his jungle actually played towards mid, but he's still in a favorable situation right now. What does he go here? Goes Vamp Scepter, refillable pink ward, pretty stock standard stuff. Walks back mid lane here. His top lane is doing well. His bot lane's actually dying. Ezreal's actually one of the better AD carries into Lucian in mid game because of how easy it is for them to build armor. Ends up getting back here. It'll be interesting to see what he, how he plays the wave now, though. Because he has no summoners, and Zerath has no summoners as well. It's very difficult to slow build waves into Zerath. So if you're going to, like, this is actually probably one of the harder matchups. Yes, there's a lot of kill threat, but you can't really do this strategy as reliably. So, a bit of an annoying matchup. Especially when you're versing a Nunu jungle. So he's trying to slow build waves here. Oh, I got hit by the E and the W. Dang it. This is where that lifesteal is really coming into play. He's popping... He popped a refillable here. 
So this is where he plays, this is what happens in this VOD. He gets a little bit behind because he gets hit by too many abilities. But he's leaning onto the bot side, getting some vision onto bot side so he can safely lean onto one side. I don't know if he commits here. He doesn't commit. It's just fast forward a bit here. Goes back to lane, gets hit by another W. Hasn't really hit a Q. And as you can see here, it's very difficult for Lucian to actually land or actually get any meaningful poke because you're not able to build any meaningful waves. But he's doing a decent job here. So now he's got level 6. So let's see if things change a bit here. So he's still 46 to 29 CS. Zareth missing CS under tower. What happened there? What trade did he do? So he queued. Q. No, auto. Q. I uh, couldn't, proc, couldn't proc the PTA there because of the stun. Dodged the Q nicely. Missed the Q again. Not too bad though. Ideally though, he probably just wants to farm for Dirk. And then once he gets Dirk, he can probably um, get some work done. Now keep in mind guys, look at this. This is, again, one of the other strengths of Lucian when you're playing into these high cooldown mid laners. Notice, if Zareth wants to constantly try and thin the wave, he has to spend a lot of mana. So look at this. Lucian's just auto-attacking the wave. He doesn't really have to spend much mana. So this whole time, if Zareth wants to get a decent amount of CS, he has to spend a lot of his resources killing the wave before it even hits the tower, which means Zareth can't spend too many resources onto the Lucian. So look at this. This whole time... Again, yes, at the start, when Zareth did have mana, yes, he got poked down quite a lot. But now as the lane's getting extended out, he's utilizing... Um, Lucian's able to utilize that Vamp Scepter, that lifesteal. Zareth's really not able to do anything. And actually, this is a really good understanding of resources, resource management, and understanding the strengths and weaknesses of um, a champion like Lucian with this build into a high cooldown, high mana cost mid lane mage. Very similar in a way to how you play Zed. It's the same concept. A lot of the time when you're playing Zed into high cooldown, high mana mages, if you minimize, or in Akali, if you minimize the early lane, they're not going to be able to poke you enough meaningfully to, to get stuff done because they're just going to go oom in the early laning phase. But anyway, he gets this wave. Oh, does he stay? Oh my god, does Zareth actually stay? So Lucian ends up deciding to stay. Let's fast forward a little bit here. Just some basic laning, nothing too special. He's up 20 CS so far, which is very good. Now he's base for his Dirk, got his control ward, coming back to lane. Let's see how he plays this lane now. So, as you can see, Zareth is not a bad, bad champion into, um, into Lucian in the early laning phase. But I think if Zareth's going even, though, with Lucian, he just doesn't have the same threat as, say, a Syndra would. Because the CC is not as reliable. He can't go on the side lane at all. Skirmish-wise, Syndra can match, do much better than Zareth. And now Lucian's going to start to take away with this lane. Especially once... Lucian can start doing jungle camps and things like that. It's going to get out of control pretty fast. So here, I believe, oh, he gets ganked. So this was actually, I remember watching this. This was the first mechanical misplay. In my opinion, he actually could have killed Nunu really easily here. So all he has to do, he dodges this, auto, W, R, and chase down. He's actually dead, but he misses the R, and he doesn't W before. So this was one of those mechanical misplays here. But anyway, he gets a decent chunk. But he gets chunked out by the by the Zerath. And if we fast forward a little bit, he actually gets hit by a few a uh, few Qs. Tries to get the wave out, gets stopped, gets another a plant, comes back to lane. What happens here? So he gets a plant, comes back to lane. That's actually something you can do, by the way, on Lucian a lot. Is actually utilize because you have so much lane pressure. Similar to how Doinby used to play Rise, you just shove, use your resources on the wave, and same as Rumble, and then you can just go in and take every single um fruit. But anyway. Now, again, he's trying to slow build waves a bit. He's not hard pushing. He's trying to get some Qs down. Nice little trade. Fast forwarding a bit here. Shoves the wave in. And as you can see, Zareth is losing a lot of farm because he's not able to match the amount of sustain wave clear as this Lucian. But he ends up oh, nearly killing this Nunu here. Tries to recall, and then he actually just gets sniped by the Zerath under tower with some ults. Bit annoying. So let's actually go back and, and just review this here. So as we can see, um, Zerath got kind of chunked out. And because Lucian's not just hard pushing the wave, and this is what I mean by, by wave control. So you, you, you slow build, and then you wait or try and bait out abilities, 
whether Zareth uses Q or W on the wave. Then you just E forward, take a very aggressive trade. Now, in this situation, most mid laners, even if you get a good trade, they can't kill the wave fast enough and deny, like, deny many creeps because it takes them a while whether they have no mana or they don't have, you know, obviously they don't have attack speed, things like that. So it's very difficult for them to shove in the wave. Because Lucian has, you know, you're building... Um, a lot of AD, your Q's AoE, that sort of thing. You can just sh just destroy waves. Now, <clears throat> as we can see here, he shoves in the wave, denies Zareth a lot of CS. Nunu is very annoying and, and tries to collect the CS or prevent Lucian from shoving in the wave. He nearly kills here. Oh, one auto at more. He just survives. And now, when Lucian would have had tempo... Um, he has to stay and use Culling to survive, I mean, to catch CS. And he's still 100 CF to 100 CS to 71. So he hasn't really done anything special. He's still 100 to 71 CS. So he's got his Sanguine Blade now, and this is where the game kind of changes. So his bot lane is 0-3. He's 0-1. The game, as you say, yes, he's got a strong Furo, but it's definitely not GG, especially versus Fed. You know, Nunu's quite Fed. Zareth's actually quite strong. Got Lost Chapter. The Ezreal's farming up. Got a, got a Man Immune. Comes back to lane here, shoves out, gets to get the wave out. Now, this is exactly one of the strengths I mentioned in the earlier portion. If the enemy decides to roam against you and you have Sanguine Bay, look what you can actually do to a tower play. Look at this. So, Zareth roams top to a play. So, Lucian, instead of roaming and following roams, you just sit mid. And look at how many plates you can get by yourself. Because you're attack speed. And damage, early damage. So he's got one, and then someone's forced to TP. So he gets he gets two plates here, which is very nice. Now Nas forced to TP, and then, as you can see by the way, the overheal starts to become quite meaningful. It starts to become relevant as you're starting to get a little bit more um, life still and a little bit more, you know, scaling comes into play. Now fast forwarding a little bit here, he gets the scuttle. What happens here? Okay, so he goes for a aggressive, very aggressive trade. I feel like, why did he W? This is another mechanical misplay. I feel like he should just EW here as well. Gets a very nice trade. Forces the Zerath to flash. One shots the wave. Again, queuing through the wave. So as you can see, he hasn't really roamed. He hasn't, like, invaded the jungle. He's playing very greedily, very selfishly. 135 CS by 13 minutes 30. Utilizing his Sanguine Blade to get a lot of plates. He's got three plates basically by himself. If his team was able to secure a Rift Herald, it's basically a dead tower. Now, fast forwarding, um, Zarath's a little bit strong with Ludens, but by the time the Mages, most Mages, get to their Ludens or the first core item, you can one shot the wave, you can begin to go to the side lane, and we fast forward in a second, gets a few more waves, whatever. Now he's got his BF Sword, he's got his Berserker Grease, and now he begins to go to the side lane. So he's got 154 CS by 15 minutes, and he hasn't even really got a jungle camp. He hasn't got a single jungle camp yet. Now, that's this is when you can really start to get some serious work done. Because 15 minutes, either, usually either bot lane is either side. His bot lane actually lost, so the enemy um, swapped to mid lane, so now he's in the side lane. And the Zarath can't really do anything at this point, so... Usually when you're versing these high range control mages, they'll actually try and stay mid and you'll have to match the enemy AD carry support in the side lane, but we'll see what happens in this VOD. So now he's in the side lane and this is where you can really take away and farm. This is where you should be getting Krugs, you should be taking their Gromp, you should be taking Towers, and this is where the strength of Sanguine Blade really comes into play here. Drawing a lot of pressure. Just fast forward a bit here. Just farming. Very difficult to kill in the side lane with that mobility, with that E. Now, this is exactly what I'm talking about. You can pick people in transition so easily here with your Sanguine Blade. You get one pick, one person comes with you, bit of CC, mow them down with your ultimate, boom, boom, follow up, bang. Like, generally, when I watch this guy's VODs, it's generally what he does. He farms up a storm in the early game, gets with Sanguine Blade, gets extremely far ahead, um, and inflated in terms of CS numbers, goes to one random skirmish at 17 minutes coming from the side lane, either one-shotting someone in the side lane or creating a man advantage or picking someone in rotation, gets one or two kills, and then he becomes an absolute menace. So now he's 168 CS by 17. This is not an amazing showing because he did die in the early game. He got ganked, messed up. He could have been much higher because he wasn't able to take any jungle camps. But as you can see here, he's going for the uh, the cloak and the double longsword over the, over the uh, Caulfield's Warhammer. Now he starts to go into the side lane. Same thing. Push, push, push. 
Now, notice if a team fight breaks out, you're not just going to mindlessly side, put, side lane. He will group four team fights, but generally your default response should be go to the side lane at least to attempt to create a man advantage fight. Anyway, as you can see now, he's grouping, he's hit his power spike, mowing people down. This is exactly the strength of Lucian after you farm so well. Like, you just become this just absolute menace in these skirmishes because your mobility. Like, you know, in this game, he actually has a Yumi on top of him as well, so um, <laughs> it makes it a lot easier, but it's still the same premise. Now, again, default into the side lane, shove, 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 reset, got his uh, Essence Reaver, same thing, default, blue buff, side lane, and this is, look, look at this, this is where you make picks in the side lane, and this is what he was talking about to me in terms of Sanguine Blade, making picks in the side lane. Look at this, this nah. Boom. <laughs> You just like you just assassinate people in the side lane. And yes, that Nar was very far behind, but you know, same premise exists. Shoves the side lane all the way out deep, looking to take the enemy uh, enemy Krugs here, keeping up those farm numbers, and getting towers, mowing down towers <laughs> with that Sanguine Blade. Pretty straightforward stuff. Here. Exactly what we mentioned in the guide. Uh, fast forward a little bit further. And if we fast forward a little bit more, he ints a little bit. And in terms of ending this game, he consistently goes to the side lane, looks for aggressive plays, creating man advantage fights, farming jungle camps in rotation. Um, and then when he sees his team group, he will group and play these front to back team fights or make those weird little skirmish plays. So it's not the end of the world. You don't if even if you're um, even if you do have this Sanguine Blade build, don't feel bad for grouping. Because you're going to be so inflated or so far ahead of the enemy at this point, it doesn't really matter. And like I said, and like he said, you've gotten so much done in the early port, early to mid game that the late game, now it, it just really doesn't matter. You're so inflated, it really um, doesn't matter. Now he's just trolling, killing them in their, in their base. <laughs> that sort of thing. So that's pretty much it. I just wanted to basically show you the premise of the build and how it really operates. And now, as you can see, he's 246 to 164. This generally happens in most of his games. And then he rides it out to a victory. So what we're going to do now, guys, is we're going to go through the community Q&A and answer a bunch of questions that you guys sent me on my community post. Now for the community Q&A, guys. So the first question here from Olaf. Why did Lucian, out of every 80 carry, become a new OP mid laner, but picks like Tristana and Callista fell out of the solo lane? Well, the first thing you need to understand in terms, in terms of comparing Tristana to Lucian is that Tristana only has one gear. All her trading patterns revolve with going in. Go, go, go. Jump in. Get the bomb stacks. That sort of thing. Very aggressive one-dimensional trading. Compare that with Lucian, given the Q buffs and the Q radius buffs, you can actually sit back, relax, poke from a range with Q through the minions without even having to commit aggressively with your E. That gives him a lot more reliability, a lot more versatility, and allows him to minimize some of those trickier matchups like Syndra, and even like Akali. So that option to be non-committal is actually very important. Now, yes, Tristana does scale much better than Lucian, but again, that lack of versatility in your trading patterns makes her a lot less consistent. Although, it is still an option, just not something you can just blind pick every single game. Now, the main reason Callista's not seen, though, is because there were some nerfs with, with Callista, but mainly because she's just too hard mechanically. She's a very difficult <laughs> difficult champion to play mechanically, and we still see her quite a lot in China, high elo Chinese solo queue because... That's just the only caliber of players that can actually utilize Callista effectively without just inting. Because if you die once with Callista, you're done. You're beyond useless. So uh, I still think Callista is solid in certain matchups, but just not many people know how to play her and don't really have the confidence or the ability to utilize her kit. Now, the next question from Assault C1. When to pick ways to snowball as a solo lane marksman? Now... Due to Sanguine having the best PvE stats in the game, it allows you to farm like a demon going 12 CS per minute. This accelerates you above and beyond your counterpart. That's really how you're going to snowball. And especially when you're going to be in the side lane, you're going to be farming up those Krugs, those Gromp, those Wolves, whatever it is. That is going to allow you to really snowball. And if you're not farming effectively as Lucian and getting above the curve and being really inflated in terms of just... XP and CS, and gold, sorry, um, then you're really not going to be able to snowball and carry those games. Now, you should either be getting a solo kill in the landing phase as Lucian, or at least two or three plates by yourself. If you're not doing that, 
then you're doing something wrong as Lucian. And in combination with your pressure, you should be getting Rift Heralds, given you have lane control, and that can really explode the game. Because if you break that tier 1 mid, the game just, just explodes. There's really nothing that the enemy can do anymore. Because then you can start denying more camps, you can move your vision debuff, you can press on the side lanes, and the side lane towers dies, that sort of thing. And like I said, last point here, side laning with Lucian is very important for both farming and making picks. Like I said before, guys... The great thing about going to the side lane, you don't have to stay in the side lane, although that's viable, especially if you're going this Sanguine Blade build. But largely, you're either dragging someone to the side lane, in which you can run them down, chase them down the long lane, or pick them in transition, or create a man advantage fight. That's how you're going to be able to snowball um, and create those advantages as a solo lane marksman. Next question here from HQBM. How to pressure enemy early, not taking damage from the wave. Let's say Lucian into ZLB. How to walk around wave, early levels, how to play after level 3. I'm hoping I covered a lot of this within my video. But to reiterate, you will win trades a lot of the time, even if you do take minion damage. And we saw that in that VOD with the Lucian versus Zarath. He still took, like, what, one or two autos from the range creeps and came out ahead in the trade because of how effectively he proc'd that PTA and getting those extra autos down. But some stronger level 1 champions like LeBlanc, to be honest with you, maybe even Syndra, you can't really walk past the wave as effectively. So, you'd probably just have to either queue through the casters or even hold your E, wait for them to use an ability, then E pass their ability. But when you're versing very weak level 1 champions like Zed, you won't even have that problem. You can literally just walk past the wave and straight up abuse them, as long as that you're ideally dodging that isolated Q with your E. Now, keep in mind, it really does depend on your itemization as well. If you start Doran's Blade, that's not really how you want to be trading because you don't have access to immediate resources. But if you're starting things like, you know, Corrupting Pot or Longsword 3 Pots, then you have a lot more access to, to resources. So it's okay to heavy trade levels 1 and 2, that sort of thing. And you probably can't walk past the wave level 1 if you're, if you're starting Cole or Doran's Blade. Now, there is actually a location in the, in the lane. And if you time your autos with the range creeps, like I said before, you can actually auto them. Um, past the range creeps without taking any minion aggro, but I'll probably need to cover this in a separate video. Now, next one here from Eccentric Lee. How do you play against it? I'm hoping I covered that in the counter section, but extra tips. Never get low enough for Lucian to utilize his Ignite. If he gets one kill, he will snowball out of control. Uh, pay attention to the amount of creeps in your wave, because if there's not many creeps in your wave, you've got to keep in mind that he can get kill them very quickly, and he can start using his culling on you, chase you down, get a very, very good chunk. So you've got to be very conscious of the amount of creeps in your wave. Pink defensively to create gang threat. One of the biggest counters or the biggest best ways to navigate Lucian is make it very difficult for Lucian to E forward. If he's scared and he doesn't have vision and can't really lean to one side and you've pinked very nicely onto one side, maybe, you know, above that ramp, on that ramp side, so we can't really lean to that ramp side, it's going to be harder for Lucian to trade aggressively onto you. And the main one, make sure you're holding CC and, def and your defensive abilities um, in lane, because if you're using them aggressively, then you're just going to get absolutely destroyed. That's where Lucian's going to be able to dodge with his E, he's going to take those aggressive trades, and then he's going to heavy trade, and it's going to get out of control. So make sure you hold them. If you're playing, you know, Zoe, if you're playing Syndra, don't just randomly throw out the E. Use it as a form of self-peel and take it slow and play with your jungle in those 2v2s. Um, that, that's probably the biggest advice I can give, plus, you know, going over that counter slide. Now for Mark Harold. How's the laning phase versus assassins like Zed, Talon, Echo? Lucian destroys these matchups, by the way. They're basically unplayable, in my opinion. If, if Lucian builds Tarbis early, or even sits on an early Null Magic Mantle, and because Lucian actually takes Exhaust 90% of matchups, and can even build PD, it's very, very difficult to beat a Lucian mid lane as an assassin. And if the Lucian actually builds a single Doran's Blade, or even like a double Doran's Blade, that HP is not... You're just not going to get through that. You're not going to be able to 100 to 0, so... Um, very, you don't really want to play those sorts of champs into, um, into Lucian mid lane. Now for Samuel Vega Suarez, why do I end up always 2 and 11 every game? Don't worry, I've had plenty of those games. It's most likely because you're not using your lane control to lean to your vision and tunneling too hard on punishing the 1v1 rather than being calculated. If you don't have the mid lane fundamentals of warding, basic jungle tracking, basic warding and leaning, that sort of thing, you will find yourself dying a lot. This also could be you using your E overly aggressive when you don't have vision or your jungle's not in the area. It could also be that you are maybe autoing too much in the middle of the wave and dying. It could also be because you are not slow building waves and really missing out a lot of opportunities. 
Most likely though, um, I would bet a lot of money. It's all to do with incorrect warding um, and not actively thinking about your jungle's location. Now, keep in mind, guys, Lucian Mid isn't like Zoe. I mentioned this before, but it's much more controlled aggression. You don't really want to be trading kills one for one. You don't want to be mindlessly blowing flash. You should be using your early strength to value farm incredibly highly. Now, another one here from Mr. Clean TM. When to move to the side lane and split versus help the team. For example, I'll get ahead and be splitting because I'm forcing more than one person to come face me, push me out. But then the team loses 3v4 and I get blamed for splitting. Basically, what should I look for in order to start splitting or grouping with the team on Lucian? As a lot of the time, with utility eddy carries, I'll be the main damage source. Now, this isn't really a Lucian-specific Lucian thing. I actually have videos on this on my channel. Uh, I have a video somewhat recently. It was a when to split and when to group. I think it was a solo queue concepts video. I would watch that one. But it, my rule for solo queue anyway is if my team is grouping and they're ahead already or they're posturing aggressively, then I will always group. That's like basically the golden rule of solo queue. But if your team is, you know, maybe they are really far ahead and you already have plenty of vision and the enemy doesn't have, uh, the enemy doesn't have much engaged, then I'll really feel okay with side landing. There's no one answer. It just depends on the composition. It depends on the elo you're within. I cover it all within that video. Um, but you've got to be adaptable. You've got to be like water. Um, so very much keep an open mind. But the great thing about Lucian is that he does have the option to both split or group. So as long as you are farming jungle camps as often as possible, you will be fine in terms of translating those leads. But um, yeah, I don't really think this is a Lucian problem, man. I think this is just you not understanding when to group or when to split in general as a mid laner, in which that video can really solve your problem. Nacho, a poking mage like Zerath, Velko Ziggs is a good pick against him. Hopefully in that video we showed you, or that VOD we showed you, Lucian versus Zerath VOD, showed you its strengths and weaknesses. I think it's okay in the early portion of the lane because you can't really, these champions can prevent Lucian from building waves into you. But in my opinion, Lucian can dodge too many skill shots. He can shove the wave into you, force you to miss so much CS on the tower. That's why we saw nearly 100 CS gap in that VOD. Plus, he can also build lifesteal. He can take Corrupting Pot, neutralize that poke very easily. And on top of this, like I said, he has incredible wave clear. So I don't think those are the champs you want to be picking into Lucian. Next one here from Exus Burn. When should you buy tier and when you should sacrifice it for the early game damage? Are there any specific matchups that are favorable for Mirror Mine Illusion over Bork Essence? Never ever ever build tier over pickaxe. Like I said in the itemization section, if you do this, your Nexus instantly explodes. Mirror Mine versus Essence, it's less about the matchup and more about the way you want to play the champion and the game pace at your specific elo. If you feel like games are always getting dragged out for like, you know, a long time, then Mirror Miners might be a little bit better for you. But if you want to add, you know, really turn up that aggression, play a little bit faster, um, then I would go Essence. For me personally, I just think Essence IE is just the way to go. Um, it just feels like I'm in a lot more in control of the game. But if you want to kill people with culling later in the game, that sort of thing, then um, Mirror Miners, the, the, uh, the item build for you. And Bork's just situational. You shouldn't just be building Bork every game. That's a very situational pick. You're versing high HP stacking mid laners. Sometimes you can even do it into things like Nunu mid, but I would mainly only do it into like set mid. Or maybe like another tank mid laner. I don't know any other tank mid laners off the top of my head. But yeah, mainly just set mid. Hazard, what's the benefit of picking Lucian over other mid 80 mids such as Zed? Is it to fill holes in your comp or is it to penalize mistakes in the in opponent's draft? Well, the difference between Lucian and other AD mids is that he literally nearly gets priority in every single matchup. He's incredibly blindable and can adapt his build to verse any style of composition. Other AD, car or other AD style mid laners don't really have that luxury. Zed can't verse a lot of tank oriented champions. Zed also um, gets hard countered by certain items in CC, like Zonya's or hard CC compositions. And Zed also can't break plates like Lucian. Lucian can push, push the pace of the game and create way more play opportunity and river control more than any other champion in the game actually so uh zed and lucian are very different champions and um it's basically the versatility and blindable nature of lucian that makes him a better pick in my opinion if you know how to play lucian properly uh Di diane cruz why are lucian and tristana the only mid laners that we see why don't we see champions like draven caitlin or Siva? so hopefully i mentioned the tristana thing but 
Mo the, uh, one big reason is that these laners don't have the luxury of build pass like Lucian does, therefore having large power troughs. Champions like Caitlyn and Seva, they can't really build Sanguine Blade, they can't really build, you know, Bork and things like that. Yes, they can, but it's way less, it's not that good on them, like, they need crit. Um, so their power troughs are much larger. That's one, ele one element of it. Yes, Draven can actually go Sanguine Blade, but the difference is between Draven and Lucian is that Draven doesn't have any mobility. Yes, he has a movement speed steroid, but that's no... In you can't even compare a movement speed steroid to a, a massive gap closer, like a, a, like a dash. So Draven actually just dies to ganks way too easily. Plus, his range is very low, and he doesn't have that non-committal style of trading. He has to like walk in aggressively, very linearly, whereas Lucian can poke with Q from, from range. So again, it's that committal versus non-committal. So mid lane is overall, to be a mid laner, you have to have that balance between mobility or range or threats. Caitlyn and Siva don't have that. N none of these champions really have that. So um, that's the main reason, guys. And that's all the main questions I thought I um, would cover. Hopefully the rest is really covered in the, in the guide section. Hopefully you learn a bit from this video. Uh, if you have any more questions about this champion, feel free to let me know in the comment section below or join the Discord and ask, ask away there. Uh, hopefully you have a lot more success with Lucian Midlane and have a bunch of fun and good luck in your solo games. Cheers guys.